Thank you very much uh, for this introduction, Dr. Rahir, and thank you very much for having me here. It's a big pleasure. It's first time in Indonesia for me, and I had, I've seen a lot already from Jogjakarta and have a lot of food, a lot of wonderful food. <laughs> so I may uh, have to go on diet when I return home. <laughs> yeah. So it's big pleasure, and I like to, like, um, I'm a lecturer for a long time. Mostly I teach pharmacy students. But it's a big pleasure to uh, talk with you and learn from you as well, how you, uh, and, and hopefully give you some, some um, words on, on, mainly on prescribing and good medication use. Uh, yeah. First, I've got some slides. Everyone knows where the Netherlands are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, I thought so, but I brought a map, just in case. And Groningen, ev anyone has been to Groningen? No. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, you have been as well. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Anyone to the Netherlands? Yeah. Rest? Okay. A few more. Yeah. Excellent. Groningen is up in the north of the Netherlands, very north, near the sea. And this is, it's a very, it's an old city, very old city, very nice old buildings, like the big church you see, and we've got canals, but we have got bad weather, and it's raining most of the time. <laughs> But you don't see on these pictures. Um, <laughs> okay, next one. This is just a few uh, figures of my university. It's also 400, more than 400 years old, one of the oldest one in the Netherlands university. You can study all different kinds of topics. It's a very broad university. And um, uh, we have a very, very it's teaching is very important. We have a lot of students, undergraduate, postgraduate students, PhD students from all over the world. I think we have within the Netherlands maybe also biggest group of Indonesian students of uh, Dutch universities. And we also have also a few very famous researchers. Like We have a Nobel Prize winner from 2016 in chemistry in, in my faculty. So that's um, research is also very important. Um, okay, next one. And this is where my department, we click, yeah. this is where my department is. We are, our department of pharmacy is attached to the medical school and the big university hospital, but we are part, not part of the medical faculty, but part of natural science and um, engineering. Um, and this is very important because we are like a bridge between, pharmacy is a bridge between science and engineering and medicine. So that's very nice that we're here. And this is how we offer a bachelor in pharmacy, we offer a master in pharmacy, and we also offer a master in medical pharmaceutical sciences. And maybe this would be one, if you plan for the future, to study in the Netherlands. This master in medical pharmaceutical sciences may be a very good option to study more on pharmacoepidemiology or dr safe drug use or and pharmacotherapy, any of those are covered. It's a research master for two years. Uh, and we also have a lot of Indonesian stud students taking this master. And some of them take that as a step towards then going on to do a PhD as well. It's a very good foundation to do that. Yeah. So that's a little bit. And this is our building, a very fancy golden building. And my office is just behind that. I'm not in the fancy golden building, the old building behind that. <laughs> but um, that's... Um, that's a little bit about Groningen. Then next slide, yeah. And this is what I would like to discuss with you. The first bit, first half of the lecture, I want to discuss with you really about good prescribing and what is that and what does that mean for, for you as future doctors. Um, and the, the second one is more on strategies to achieve not only prescribing but the whole use of medicines and safe use of medicine. I want to discuss some ideas about that with you. Um, okay, next one. If we think about medication, you can click three times. Medication use, it's about prescribing, it's about medication taking, patients taking medication, or, pay, or, or nurses, for example, in hospital giving medication. It's all areas of medication use. And in all of those, we have to make sure that whatever is given is good for the patient and achieves outcomes. So that's what we... Next one. So the first bit, I want to discuss about prescribing. Just think about the prescribing part of... Because I think 
Anyone? Maybe hands up. Who wants to become a medical doctor? Okay, good, good. So this is your future. So I guess as medical doctor, you've got, you have a lot of um, responsibilities in good prescribing. So I think, uh, did you have a lecture on good prescribing? No? Okay, so at least that's, uh, that's good. <laughs> Hopefully we can look at some new. And to start about thinking about good prescribing, I thought we'll discuss a patient case, because then it's easier, it's a bit more concrete. And this is a patient case. I do a lot of research on quality of uh, medication use in old people. This is old people and polypharmacy use of a lot of medication in old people. That's a big problem in... Uh, a lot of Western countries and as we discussed it's becoming a problem here as well that how do you good, well treat old people with a lot of diseases and here you see this is a, maybe you don't find these kind of patients here in Indonesian hospitals so far but I think it doesn't matter um, uh, for, for the, for the things, thinking about the good prescribing you can think of other patients that you meet here in the hospital but Anyway, this is Mrs. Hansen. She's a really old lady and she's been admitted to a nursing home because she can't live at home anymore. She needs help with a lot of... And on the left-hand side, you see all the diseases she's got. Do you recognize the diseases? Did you learn about those diseases? Okay, yeah. Okay, okay good. So we'll see in a minute whether you remember something. And this may be a picture of Mrs. Hansen. It's not the real picture because because of privacy, but this is what, and you see from the picture she's really old and she may have problems with mobility, not being good at walking anymore, um, and she has a lot of um, diseases. How many drugs do you think she's taking? You think? How many? In the first row? Ah, you can think. Okay, let's get next picture. This is the whole list, long list of medication. Yeah. So this is really a polypharmacy patient. And um, we can look a bit more on, the, on her details. And uh, now we don't go, yeah, you count, how many? 16. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. And just to re repeat the question, now you look at the um, list of diseases. And you look at the medication, you recognize some of the medication fits with some of her problems. Anyone spot something? <laughs> yeah, calcium. Calcium for osteoporosis. Ah, well done, yeah. <laughs> And if we take the top one, ibuprofen, what's that for? You know ibuprofen? Um. <laughs> Anyone? It's analgesic, yeah, for pain. So he, she has got pain. Yeah. And we could go on uh, with this list, but maybe... Um, uh, I want to not discuss now all the details, but just think about, is this good prescribing for Mrs. Hansen? If you just look at the list now and look at this frail lady, this old lady, and look at the list of 16 medications, you think this is good prescribing? No, no, probably not. Yeah. So I think, let's go for the next slide. I want to just, we start with Mrs. Hansen just to make a bit, like make you think about what is, um, what is good prescribing? What are elements, characteristics that we uh, choose drugs for patients? Just think, just think about what we saw now with Mrs. Hansen, what might be not good, because you all said it's maybe not good, the prescribing for her. Just, um, and this is, the, this is the interactive thing. Just get your mobile phones out. <laughs> and go to menti.com. And there is the code at the top, 6, 
digits, the code. You'll see there is zero uh, <laughs> logged in, so. Can you connect? Okay, excellent. Can you log in? Okay. Okay, you've logged in. Okay, perfect. Yeah, everyone logged in. Yeah. And now the question is, just type three, wor three words, what you think is good prescribing. Just what, what does it make? What is good prescribing for patients? Like Mrs. Hansen, just any three words you think of first, what makes it if a prescription for a, for a patient is good? How can we characterize that? What are characteristics of good prescribing? Do you understand the question? Yeah? Okay. You just see, oh, efficient. Good. Because we get a whatever. Not uh, maybe everyone think of their own. <laughs> less side effects, excellent. Simple. Minimal side effects, less side effects. Yeah, other words. Just type, go on typing. Three, three things uh, you can think of. Suitable, necessary, no contraindications, informed consent, accurate, not lower quality of life. Improves health, understandable, very good, yeah. Nice. More? You can also put some more details of a prescription. He's quite general. Can anyone think of more things? If you look at all the elements of a prescription, you need to define the drug, and what else do you need to define if you write a prescription? You can think of all those, and all of those have to be, yeah, in some ways, all those details of a prescription. Reduce the pain, appropriate, proper dose, yeah. Short list, yeah. Like what, well, yeah. Less danger, minimal medicine. Good, affordable, affordable cost, uh, yeah. Excellent, excellent. I think you, you've, you've mentioned a lot now, uh, a lot of details, I think. Excellent. We'll keep this, uh, we can keep this, because this is a bit like... Um, in very, uh, very good words. Anyone has, you finished with typing in? Okay. Then, um, very nice. I think you put the essentials down, like efficient, effective use of medicines and safety. A lot of you put in a lot of different ways safety, like no contraindications, um, less side effects. Uh, and I think there are a number of ways, and of course how, to, how other people have already defined good prescribing. And I think a nice way of, this was my PhD supervisor, uh, Nick Barber from University of London, University College London, and he put it in a very, I think a very nice simple way. Four things have to be in balance if we look at prescribing, and one is effects, so effective prescribing, we choose effective drugs. And then one is minimize harm, uh, and this has to be in balance. Of course, it's the harm, if the harm, potential harm of a medicine is a lot higher than the potential effects, then should we prescribe? No, probably not. Uh, it has to be in balance, and of course, this depends a lot on the patient. Like for treating cancer, you. Uh, you accept a lot more side effects because it's a very serious disease. Whereas for pain treatment, we have a lot of options. You don't, you have to, it has to be low side effects for pain treatment, for example. So it depends also on the disease, but this has to be in balance. And also on the other hand, patient's wishes, so what does patient want, what is appropriate for the patient, has to be also in balance with cost cost-effective, like Jaria uh, does a lot of research also on cost-effective treatment, because of course if it's a, 
and this is a problem now in all countries, we have a lot of new, very, very expensive drugs. So how do we decide who gets those drugs? If they're so expensive, if the healthcare system can't cover them, or if in, in case of Indonesia, also health insurance can't cover it, or people can't pay for it. So how do you balance patient wishes and costs? So all four of those criteria, but you all mentioned them, so it's quite uh, already quite in your mind. So this is nice. So another one, next slide, another from the World Health Organization also, which also summarizes nicely what is appropriate uh, use of medicines. Um, this summarizes also very nicely. It has to be appropriate for clinical needs. It has to be in the right dose and also like right, right route of administration, right uh, length of uh, treatment. A lot of uh, rights has to meet. Um, and at the lowest cost to them and their community. So this also summarizes it nicely, what we aim for. Um, and how do you learn that? How do you learn this appropriate use? Because it's not that easy. It, it sounds very easy, but sometimes it's not that easy uh, to do. So this is a way we already discussed this week, how to teach, good, how to learn good prescribing how to learn this, and I think it's very nice steps. There are six steps. This is a model, six-step model that the WHO, the World Health Organization, has um, defined how to um, how to teach this. And we won't go now through all the things, but uh, in detail. But I just point out a few. So if you start with deciding about whether or not to prescribe a drug, once your first day, your junior doctor, you try and decide to prescribe a drug. You need to know a lot about what is the patient's problem, what is the, what is, uh, the patient diagnosis, and then and what is the patient's circumstances. Know a lot about the patient in choosing the appropriate treatment for patients. And then you need to define therapeutic objectives, so what do you want to achieve with the drug treatment. Like, we'll go back to Mrs. Hansen um, also, like, what is her main problem? Pain. Pain is her really big problem, which is bothering her. And so we need to, so the treatment objective is treating her pain uh, well. And it's not achieved yet, so that's um, a therapeutic objective. And then treatment choices. And this is where it comes that you need to have a lot of very good pharmacotherapy knowledge. And one of my take-home messages today is have as much pharmacotherapy knowledge as possible. Like know the drugs, know the, the indications, know the, the mechanism of action, know how they work, what are side effects, or know where to find this information. I think that's very, very important for this step, to look at all the different treatment options and know which one has less harm, which one is effective, which one has less harm. Um, and I think for this treatment choice, nowadays, it's a lot easier now than maybe 30 years ago. Because what, what do we also use when we try and think about the treatment choice? What do we use to help us? We, we use treatment guidelines. We use guidelines. And we use in, there are international guidelines, for example, that are also used here. If we want to treat hypertension or if we want to treat pain, we don't have to all know it all, but it's in treatment guidelines, international. So a lot of expert, experts have done that work and looked at treatment and defined what is best, what is first chose, depending on the evidence that's available. So in this step we need treatment guidelines but we also sometimes we need to deviate from treatment guidelines and so we not need to know the basis for these treatment guidelines and then we do the practical thing writing a good prescription and i'll come to that later on and then we need to talk with the patient because if we prescribe treatment but patient doesn't take treatment is it effective no so adherence, so that is a lot of a, a very important step to make sure patient understands and patient will take the treatment as, we, as it should be taken. Um, and then we, we don't stop there, but we also follow patients. We monitor patients. So we, we uh, look 
for safety and effectiveness of treatment. Yeah. And how do we know that this method of six-step works? There has been some research in the Netherlands by colleagues of mine, and they looked at if we teach prescribing in the way with the six steps, very systematically for every patient, and if you train students to think that way, they get better in, they have better knowledge. So this, next slide. So this is, they show, they show positive effect, teaching students a very systematic way. So I think that's the way, um, and I know pharmacology department offers a module with uh, teaching, teaching this way. Yeah, next one. Now we go back to Mrs. Sansan. We, le we learned a lot about appropriate treatment, and we already agreed this is not appropriate. So what we did in her case is look at all the medication, look at her disease, look at the medication, and then we go on, and we cut down a lot. From the 16, we can um, count again. We cut down a lot, and we, next slide. Uh, we look, pain is, like I said, pain is her main problem. So like from the sixth step, we, the pain is the biggest problem for her, her. So we rationalized her pain treatment. From six painkillers she had before, like very unusual treatment. You can use antidepressants also for pain. We all cut that out and we used two painkillers in adequate doses for, to cover her pain. And we also cut down some of the, un we found some drugs were really, that no one knew why they were used anymore. She used hormone treatment as well, and no one knew why that, why that is. So we cut down all of that, that was not, and we cut, we left a bit, little bit to treat her hypertension a little bit, and some symptoms uh, she had. So, yeah, next one, next one. So that's the bit about, about uh, prescribing, appropriate prescribing, where you need a lot of good pharmacotherapy knowledge. But I want to take you now one step even further and look a bit about the usage of medicines. And like I said before, we can use it at every stage and we have to make sure that medication is used in all of those steps. So with the next few cases, next one, I want to think with you a little bit what can go wrong and how can we, that's the second half, what can we do about that? So again, look at this. Look at this case. It's a newborn baby. The baby needs morphine and opioid for pain treatment. And even though you, you haven't uh, done that yet, but if you look very closely, is this correct? Is this good? No. What is wrong? Morphine is the good treatment, but what went wrong in this case? Someone wants to volunteer? Have a guess. The dose, yeah, very good, very good. Let's next. Uh, they realized that this was, they really gave a 10 times higher dose than was supposed to uh, this baby was supposed to get. So, in the end, the baby was not harmed. It was de detected. But this is a mistake that can happen in pediatrics. It's quite common that, they, you know, you miscalculate. And that's another one to learn, like to, um, to learn very well how to, how to calculate doses and get a feeling for doses. But we'll get more, yeah. Another one. This was a patient who had an, uh, quite a simple eye operation, but in the end, there was a bleeding. Ah, and we got the answer already. You know what <laughs> I, wanted, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, but you know what thrombolytics are? They thin, so maybe this is a, for first year students, it's quite a difficult case, but um, these thin the blood. And they, so that the blood doesn't clot. And why would you do that in patients? Why do you want some patients to have a thin blood? To prevent stroke, for example, or to, to prevent deep vein thrombosis, to be, prevent clotting, really. And this is done quite in a lot of diseases. 
But of course, it has a risk, always a risk for bleeding. So what would you need to do if someone takes thrombolytics? What would you need to do if they undergo surgery? Hmm? Check the medical history and stop or adapt it around the operation. Depending why someone is using it, you may, you may be able to stop it like seven days before operation, do the operation and then restart it again, depending, or you may switch, or, but in this case, it should have been stopped, and the patient has, a lot, or has been harmed a lot by this. Um, okay, next one. Uh, this one everyone can do, you don't need so much pharmacology knowledge. This is an HIV drug, and the nurses on the wards, and this is what it looks like, Sally Trex 500, and it's in a blister, this is the front and the back side of the blister, and you see six, pack, six tablets in total, and you see they're packed in two. And this is what it says on the back. So now, you as, you imagine you are the nurse or you are the patient, and you have to give a dose of 500 milligram Celitrex. How many p pills do you give? Hands up. You want to give two? Who wants to give two? The rest? How many, how many do you want to give? The rest hasn't decided yet, but you need to give the patient. Of course, nurses, you know, it's on the drug chart. They need to have 500 milligram. And what is the correct answer? One tablet. One tablet has 500 milligram. But you were in the majority. They did this survey in a Dutch hospital, and like more than nearly half the nurses would also give two tablets. And why is that? Yeah, it's misleading. The packaging is really misleading. It's not clear. And it's very, I mean, you can think this is very easy to make, or maybe it's not easy to make a good packaging, but this is like, you know, you develop a very good drug and you, you prescribe it very well, but in the last step you have a stupid packaging and, you know, it's stupid packaging really. And you give the wrong drug to the, uh, you give too much. And in this case it's not so dangerous, but you know, once having two instead of one tablet is not dangerous for patients, it's still within therapeutic range, but it's not good and you don't want to give that for the whole period of time. So this is another right, quite, quite a simple problem how things can go wrong. Uh, next one. And this one, this may be also for first year students a little bit difficult. Um, last example. Methotrexate. Yeah, we'll get the solution then. <laughs> methotrexate, you know methotrexate? It's a cytotoxic drug. It's used in some cancers, cytotoxic drug, but it's also used in rheumatoid arthritis as an inflammatory disease, inflammation, and it can be also used, but it's used in very low doses. Methotrexate can be used in much higher doses, but this case is low dose, 10 milligram, and once a week. Only once a week, one tablet. This is normal for patients. But in other diseases, like in cancer, you get much higher, you get much higher um, doses and you get them every day. And of course, it's very important to know why does the patient get it. Because if you get it for cancer, they're monitored very carefully. Like the, uh, one of the risks of this drug is that you get bone marrow suppression, that your immune system doesn't work anymore. And if you get it once a week, that is not much problem. But if you get it, get it instead of once, once a week, every day, you have to need to be monitored much more. And of course, why, is, why does a mistake like this happen? Because most of the drugs are given once a day. So people are used to, you know, if you get something, you know, once a day or twice a day, every day. And this is deviating from this. And so this, you need to know very well why is the drug used and how is it used. Um, to make this wrong, and in the Netherlands, this has been this mistake has been has occurred because people have doctors have prescribed it wrong, or they have transcribed it wrong, or nurses have given it wrong, or patients also have taken it wrongly because they mistaken like they take it just with their other drugs every day, and this is very very dangerous mistake. So in the Netherlands, we have now implemented some systems to to change this to make sure that this doesn't happen. Next. 
And like I've shown you now a few examples of usage problems. And then you may think, well, yeah, is this just extreme cases she's talking about? But now we know from a lot of studies that it's quite common that these adverse events happen and that things get, go wrong. And these are a, a few very big studies that have been done on adverse events in general in medicine. So people getting harmed through medicine instead of uh, getting better through medicine. And what we learn about those, a lot of them are preventable and a lot of them have to do with medication because a lot of the intervention in medicine in general are about medication, are about drug, drugs. So that's what we learn. So this, um, this is very important studies um, that have been done around the world. So next one. So this again a question. Like the arrows I've shown you, the usage problems I've shown you, why do they occur? We need to think a little bit. If you want to prevent them, if you want to make the system better, if you want to be better doctors, we need to think about why do they happen. And just this, is this correct? Because doctors, pharmacists or nurses do not pay attention. Is this the only problem? So we just need to train and say, tell them every day, you know, you must make sure you know, you pay better attention. Is this? Hmm? And the patients too. Yeah, we need to involve the patients. Very good point. But does this help us? If we just repeat, you know, you as medical students, you get, you know, in, medic in medical practice later on, you just need to pay attention. I don't think we'll get there with this. So I want to, with the next few slides, I want to show you a little bit about, you know, is it only paying attention or can we do more, can we do other things? Just another, yeah. Yeah, next one. Okay, just look at that. Oh, go to the last, last one. Um, are they horizontal, all the lines? This is an eye test. <laughs> I can see already maybe some people need a new glasses. <laughs> Are they horizontal or do they slope? Yeah, they, we know they should be horizontal, but they look like slopes. They look like going up and down. But if you look at them very, if you look with the ruler, they are really. And this is because our play, uh, brain, you know, tries to do something with the information, tries to. So sometimes mistakes can happen because our brain plays tricks. And the next one, the next one is a really funny one. Say the color of the word, not the word itself. <laughs> yeah. Who can do it? Who wants to come up here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is also, so just two examples that it's sometimes, it's even if we want to pay attention, and if we try, it things, are sometimes difficult to do that. So next one. So um, there is more to this. This is just fun, a few fun examples to show you what uh, what can happen, what makes that even if you want to pay attention, it can be difficult. And next one, there is a whole theory why errors occur. This comes from psychology, and this comes from investigating um, very big accidents in any in industry, in any in the airplane industry or in nuclear power plants, there have been big accidents and they investigated why did these accidents happen. And you can learn a lot about why such errors. And in healthcare, like in the Netherlands, about 15 years ago, they also started to look at systematically why do errors occur in healthcare using theories around this. And I want to show you, we don't have that much time, but I want to show you just a little bit explain uh, with this theory. Just click a few times. You have the whole picture. And if you look at accidents really like a wrong, like something really, you given the wrong, you prescribe the wrong drug, or you given the wrong drug to the uh, a wrong drug to a patient. If you look at the, those accidents and investigate those, you can look back, and most of the time you can find what we call active failures. So this can be that someone really at the end doing it didn't know about it, so they did the wrong thing. They didn't know what would be the correct dose for this patient, so they prescribed the correct do uh, incorrect dose. Or they, um, 
they didn't pay, they, they didn't pay attention. So they were maybe maybe they were tired, maybe they were uh, you know someone else asked them something, and they just by accident put the wrong dose uh, down. So these can be two things. But of course, this is the bit about paying attention or not knowing something. But this doesn't always help us much to prevent errors in the future. So we go back and look at why is it that people don't know something? Why is it that people are so tired then? Or why is it that people not are not able to concentrate? So we go back to error-producing conditions. And we go back to underlying problems that produce those error-producing conditions. So we, we really go back to the... Like, it may be people at the end don't know much, but that is because they never got training in this very well. So we need to start maybe in medical school to train nurses or doctors or pharmacists much better in certain aspects so they can do it at the end. Because just saying, you know, blaming people or just saying you need to be better in your job doesn't help. So the best thing is to go to these latent conditions, what we call, and, and try and do something about those. We go with the next. So this is a really theoretical model where you, which you can use, which has been used a lot in medicine to try and make things better. If we click more, yeah, one more, yeah. And this is really what we learned from investigating accidents, that as people, as humans, we are not very good if we have to remember everything. I guess you know all from every day. We are not very good in, remem in remembering a hundred things. Probably you will... And I'm not very good in remembering all drug-drug interactions. So if I have to like check prescriptions for drug-drug interactions, I can never remember all of those. So it's impossible. So that, that's why we know we need other systems. So we need to have systems where we don't rely on memory. Make things visible. Get feedback that things are correct or not correct. Standardize procedures. Use checklists and decrease reliance on vigilance so that, because we know we have attention span for some time, but we are not computers. So we need, you don't need to think of procedures where you n rely on people being vigilant all the time. And these are just some, some examples how in healthcare you can make those, learn from those and change system, like computerized prescribing. So you force computerized prescribing. If you go to the hospital, you have placement, I know this is introduced here as well, and it forces doctor to write complete prescriptions, and they are legible. So not someone else cannot make mistakes because they can't read the handwriting of someone. So this is one way of, you know, you standardize, and even you can extend that to make, to make have decision system, have drug drug interaction alerts, have a, a, a knowledge base under, underlying this. So when you prescribe something, the dose is checked automatically. Drug drug interactions are checked automatically. So these are examples how to make healthcare safer. And another one. And there are also ways, like I've shown you some examples of drug administration mistakes. There are also at this end uh, ways of improving this drug use uh, in that sense, like double checking, like um, the next one. In the Netherlands, we work a lot on barcoding. We barcode every drug and we barcode the patient and we have a link this to the computer. So we check the patient, the drug, and then there is an alert if it doesn't. It's not easy to implement such system in healthcare. Even in our hospital, it's not easy to do that because you need to have a good system. But these are ways that we, like I've shown you, these, these error, these latent conditions, we can overcome those if we develop good systems like this. Yeah? Okay. So in the end, but of course technology can't replace the good brains of good medical doctors. So I think the, the essence and the underlying base, like I said, the take-home take home message really is have a good pharmacotherapy knowledge uh, in, um, so that you can do appropriate prescribing, and, but also have, be aware of all these unsafe areas. And we could maybe go on and on about looking at unsafe areas like appropriate use where it's needed to have imp um, improvements. But I think it's nice to have a lecture like this maybe in the first year medical students because all along your medical training you can hopefully remember those practical things as well as the pharmacotherapy to improve because what you want in the end is to have the most benefit from very powerful pharmacotherapy. Just remember pharmacotherapy is not only harmful but also very, very 
a powerful tool to cure diseases, to help prevent diseases, and to help and, and um, you know, uh, treat symptoms. So, but we have to use that powerful source very well. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, I've given you some ideas about this uh, today. Okay. That's, uh, that's about it, how much I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah. And this, one last thing. If you want to know more, much, much, much more about drug utilization and safe use of medication, this is a book I've been involved as editor as well. It's also available as e-book. So this teaches you, maybe it's not now for first year students, the best lecture uh, uh, reading, but this is along your medical education, especially if you want to go in such areas of safe use, appropriate use. This is a very good basis to, to learn all about how to do that. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks.